Hello friends, welcome to our broadcast, Limitless Life, and Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas week, Merry Christmas month, Merry Christmas all year long. <laughs> That's actually the series that I started last week. I titled it Merry Christmas all year long because when you start talking about the birth of Jesus, man, you can go, what's the, the old phrase, a million and one ways? <laughs> man, you can just go to so many different things because it's all about Jesus. You know, we always say that statement that the reason for the season is Jesus, but it's a whole lot more than just a little babe lying in a manger. And, you know, a lot of things glorify that and everything. Well, thank God that the babe was born and he and laying in the manger, but then he didn't stay in the manger for very long. He came out, and boy, what he came for, why was he born? Why the birth of Jesus? Why the virgin birth is uh, so good. It's just, you, you can learn so much from it. So that's why I titled the series Christmas All Year Long, because some people will be watching this in July. So Merry Christmas in July. <laughs> Some people will watch it in, in April. Merry Christmas in April. Other people will walk, watch it in October. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas all year long. Uh, we, we, you know, we celebrate Christmas all year long, and, and that's why I titled this Christmas all year long. But what are we actually saying when we say Merry Christmas? We've been hearing it now in, in our nation for leading up till yesterday, Christmas Day. Today's the day after Christmas. Um, Merry Christmas. You're actually saying Merry Jesus celebration. That's what you're saying because Christ, you take Christ out of Christmas and all you have is a muss. <laughs> and that's, that's nothing left. And so... Um, we, we say Merry Christmas. So Jesus is the reason for the season. So, of course, last week we, we uh, honored Jesus by looking at him, uh, the types and shadows of Jesus in all 66 books of the Bible, 39 books of the Old T Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, 66 books total. We looked at Jesus in all of them. And boy, do, when we did that, even just in Proverbs and Psalms and uh, in Revelation, just those three books alone, but I mean, all the rest just was so much. But just just in those three books alone, it was like, wow, we're talking about a whole lot more than a little babe in a manger, praise God. So, so we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, and we're discussing uh, this week uh, the virgin birth, why he was born, Christmas traditions, both good and bad. Um, so let's go back to where we left off yesterday in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 gives us uh, one of the accounts of the Christmas story. In verse 1, it starts out with the genealogy of Jesus. I'm not going to go into much. I'll just recap real quick. But uh, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then verse 2 starts the genealogy where Abraham begot I Isaac, Abraham, uh, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brother and so on. So... Uh, the genealogy is real important to the Christmas story, and we went into detail why yesterday. But ver verse 1 says the book of the generation of Jesus. So before it starts talking about his verse later on down in the chapter here, uh, it tells us the book of the generation. Remember what I pointed out yesterday? That word generation is the Greek word or the Hebrew word genesis. So genesis is our new beginning, the book of the genesis our new beginning of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament started with Genesis, which, which was speaking of God's creation, but the New Testament starts with Jesus speaking of God's new creation. <laughs> and that's you and me, praise God. So it tells us in Matthew 1, Jesus was both the son of David and the son of Abraham. The son of David pointed out his genealogy as uh, government, as king of kings. Abraham, in fact, you get down to verse 6 and you can see in the context why uh, it, it lists King David uh, rather than just list the first names like it did in everybody else on all, in the genealogy. And so he's the son of David because Jesus' government uh, would have no end. And then he's the son of Abraham, showing like Abraham's son was going to be a sacrifice in the natural. Jesus became our eternal sacrifice once and for all, redeeming all of humanity and mankind. And now that we can have all the blessings that the son of Abraham had, Isaac had all the blessings of his dad, Guess what? We get all the blessings that Abraham had because of Jesus. So I shared all of that so you can see how this is such a vital part of uh, history, his, his story, his story. 
and it really helps you understand a lot more about the birth of Jesus, which actually starts in verse 18. So let's go down to verse 18 for just for time's sake here. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused, that word means engaged, to Joseph before they came together, before they had any sexual relations, uh, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, you son of David, fear not to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from his sins. All this was done, the next verse, to uh, fulfill what uh, was spoken by the prophet, a virgin shall be born. Uh, and going to bring forth a son. They're going to call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, in verse 24, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, took Mary, and uh, did not have any sex with her until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Now, let's jump over to Luke's account. We're going to put we're going to come back to this because this has got so much that we can learn from that will help us in our walk with Jesus today. But let's jump to, uh, to Luke's account of Jesus' birth because Luke gives what I call, uh, he puts a lot more meat on the bones of the story, if you know what I mean. In other words, Luke gives a lot more of the details, even things leading up to the birth of Jesus which Matthew doesn't. So these are things that are significant to the Christmas story. So in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, we're told of the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth, who gave birth to John the baptizer. Um, it, it talks about how the angel appeared to Zacharias, told him that he's, he and Elizabeth were going to have a child and to call his name John. That's in Luke 1.13. And by the way, uh, you, you probably keep hearing me say John the Baptizer instead of John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist was not his name. John was his name, <laughs> not John the Baptist. Yes, there are scriptures that call him John the Baptist, but they're not referring to his name. Uh, they're referring to what he did. He baptized people. In fact, if you look up the Greek word translated Baptist, it means baptizer is what the Greek word means. So the scriptures that call John, John the Baptist are actually calling him John the Baptizer, letting us know that he, he was a baptizer. And that's significant in the Christmas story because he ended up baptizing Jesus, didn't he? Who was the King of Kings and our, and our Lord. So John was called John the Baptizer. However, when John was called by God, he was called to be a prophet. Uh, in fact, when John came on the scene, there had been... Uh, prophetic silence for nearly 400 years since the time of Malachi. And then finally, along comes John, a prophetic voice out in the wilderness crying, proclaiming the coming of a Messiah. Wow. Uh, one that would save his people from their sins. In fact, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about John, listen to this, 700 years before John was born. 700 years before he came on the scene. Let me show you that in Isaiah 40, verse number 3, the voice of him, here's Isaiah prophesying, 700 years before John's born, uh, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. <laughs> this is a prophecy about John saying he would be a voice in the desert cr crying, prepare the way of the Lord. That kind of sounds like the voice of an evangelist, doesn't it? <laughs> but the scripture calls John a prophet. In fact, let me show you what Jesus said in Luke 7. We'll come back here in Luke uh, chapter 1 and chapters 2. But uh, Luke 7, uh, verse 23. No, verse 28. Luke 7, 28. For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet then John the baptizer, the literal Greek says, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So Jesus said that John the baptizer was the greatest prophet 
that had ever lived until that time. Think about that for a minute. John was greater than all the Old Testament prophets. And we can think, excuse me, we can think of a lot. I mean, you can think of Elijah. What a great prophet he was. Elisha. Isaiah, who actually prophesied what we call the great redemptive chapter of Isaiah 53. That was awesome. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Abraham was called a prophet. So was Moses called a prophet. Samuel was called a prophet. David was called a prophet. And Jesus said, John the baptizer was greater than all of them. And I, I, I never thought about John the baptizer being, because you don't hear about him making these great uh, statements that we think, you know, oh man, that's going to cause an ax head to swim and that's going to cause the rain to stop for three years. And I just, you know, you'd, you, we just never thought of John the baptizer as being a great prophet. And yet he was the greatest that ever lived probably because of the connection with Jesus, right? I mean, the direct connection lived at the same time. So anyway, Luke 176 calls John the prophet of the highest. <laughs> In other words, he was a prophet that prophesied about Jesus, the highest prophet of all, right? Jesus stood in all five classes that Ephesians 4.11 talks about. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Jesus stood in all those offices. So this is letting us know Jesus is an integral part of the story of Jesus' birth. In fact, do you know what John's name means? The name John means God is gracious. Well, think about John 1.17. It says grace came, grace and truth came by Jesus, and John's the one that prepared the way for Jesus. Therefore, John prepared the way for grace and truth to come. And it's also noteworthy that John and Jesus were related. <laughs> they were cousins. Cousin John prepared the way for his cousin Jesus through Mary, of course, Mary and Elizabeth, who were cousins. So that would explain why you see Mary, when we read this story, you'll see Mary go visit Elizabeth when Elizabeth was pregnant with John and Mary was pregnant with Jesus. So let's pick up the story in verse 24 of Luke 1. Luke 1, verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Uh, so uh, this tells us that when Elizabeth got pregnant with John, she hid herself from the public for five months. Interesting. Why, why five months? Maybe, maybe to hide uh, as long as possible. Remember, remember Zacharias, her husband, uh, couldn't talk. And uh, he, in fact, he could not talk until John was born. Let me just show you that real quick in a couple of verses. In verse 57, let's start reading Elizabeth. When, she, when her full time came to deliver John, she brought forth a son. Her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and, the, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise John, and, and they called his name Zacharias after his father. And his mother answers, no, no, his name's going to be John. And they said, but there's nobody by your kindred by that name. And so they made signs uh, to, to Zacharias and, and asked him because uh, they knew he couldn't talk. So they were going to have to write, get him to write back. And he asked for a writing table when they asked him, well, so what should we, could, shouldn't we call him after you, Zacharias? And so he asked for a writing table in verse 63. And, the, and he wrote down, his name is John. And they marveled. And his mouth was opened immediately. <laughs> Finally got his tongue back, hooked back up with the Spirit of God uh, instead of doubting like he did before when his tongue had to be stopped. But his tongue opened immediately, his tongue loosed and spake and praised God. So, so um, uh, Zacharias could not talk from the time Gabriel shut his mouth, which was back in verse 20 of this chapter. And then he, he stayed a mute unable to speak until John was born. Think about that. That's over nine months. Over nine months. So if you were Elizabeth, we're talking about why she hid herself for five months. Well, just 
who's going to want to try and explain to people what happened to my husband and, and uh, all that. In fact, verse 25 may give us a little insight here uh, about that. It says, thus has the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. So this, this shows us that she'd been reproached. She had been insulted. She had been ridiculed. She had been put down. First of all, for her inability to have a child, probably told things like, your baby's going to be deformed, you know, you're old, you can't have a baby this late. And, and, uh, and then when her husband, you know, when that happens to him and all of a sudden he can't speak, then she's going to be judged unfair, unfairly about Zacharias. I'm sure some people said, so what sin did Zacharias commit that caused God to make him a mute? Your husband's supposed to be making sacrifices for our sins and he can't even cover his own. <laughs> yeah. Your husband should be kicked out of the priesthood. Hmm. Can you see how all of this story is intertwined into the birth of Jesus? And then in verse 26, it begins telling us the story of Mary's pregnancy with Jesus. So in verse 26, and in the sixth month of angel... Uh, Six month, the Gabriel angel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Interesting part of the story here, verse, verse 26, in the sixth month. This is not talking about the sixth month of the year. You can see that when you read it in context. Uh, the word and, and, of, of the very first word of verse 26, and, uh, ties this in with the previous verses. Well, verse 24 said, Elizabeth conceived and hit, her, hit, hit herself five months. And then verse 26 says, and in the sixth month. So this is talking about the sixth month of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy. So it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph and of the house of David, and the vir virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Hail, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Notice God told Mary she was highly favored. That's the Greek word uh, keratu, charitu, I think it's keratu, which comes from the Greek word charis, which I'm sure you, you know which uh, the word charis, where we get the word grace was from. So God was saying, Mary, I'm giving you grace. And we know according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, by grace we're saved through faith, and Romans 5, 1 and 2, that uh, it takes faith to receive grace. Uh, so God says, hail or rejoice is what the word hail Mary, rejoice Mary. God is extending his grace to you. The Lord is with you. You are a blessed woman. And the word woman here means wife or betrothed woman is literally what the Greek is, grace, uh, uh, Greek is talking about. And so it goes on, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She cast in her mind what manner of sal salutation this should be. The angel said, don't fear. Uh, you found favor with God. Behold, you're going to conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, shall call his name Jesus, and he's going to be great and be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then Mary asked the question, so how are you, how's God going to do this? She wasn't doubting at all because you can go back to the first part of the chapter when Zacharias was doubting and, and Gabriel said, you know what? I, I can't have you talking doubt and unbelief. I'm going to have to shut your mouth or else you'll stop the plan of God. And so he didn't do that with Mary. So we know Mary's not asking in unbelief. Mary says, how's this going to be since, I, since I've never had sex with a man? And the angel said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come on you, and the power of God Almighty is going to overshadow you. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. So God says, I am going to, uh, I am going to put the seed in your womb is what I'm going to do. It's going to be a supernatural birth. So Mary asked Gabriel, how was going, God going to cause her to be pregnant since she had not had any sexual relations? And Gabriel tears, tells her, well, God's spirit is going to come on you and God's power is just going to envelop you. And then you would have a baby in your womb and the baby was going to be a saint and he was going to be called the son of God. 
Uh, so what Mary just heard, think about it, because he, he had to tell her, fear not, Mary, which tells me then the natural inclination would be, oh my God, who, who is this? What, what, are you, what are you saying to me? This, am I hallucinating? You know, she had fear come, so he had to tell her to fear not. So what she's heard was mind-boggling beyond mental comprehension. I mean, no human being in the history of mankind had been birthed from a womb of a woman without being impregnated by a man. Wow. I mean, this was totally in the realm of impossibility. But God didn't stop there. God said in the next verse, look at verse 36, And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived, which we knew was a miracle because she was way too old. So was Zacharias. So your cousin Elizabeth, she's conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. This is where we discover that Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Uh, they were obviously close because Mary went and spent three months with her and Zacharias after she found this out. So she did not know, of course, there were no cell phones of that day and no mail of that day and stuff. And so uh, here it is six months into her pregnancy. She didn't know Mary, Elizabeth was pregnant. The angel is telling her. So the first six months of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary didn't know about it and then found out. And uh, that would help us understand why um, she went and visited Mary or went and visited um, Elizabeth. So, so. That means Mary knew of Elizabeth's situation of not being able to have children, right? She did know that, but did not know that uh, God had made her pregnant until she was told here, but she knew it was impossible. She probably knew that Elizabeth and Zacharias had prayed for a child, just like the angel Gabriel said. So that would be uh, pretty exciting news for Mary to hear your cousin Elizabeth's pregnant, but also... Uh, knowing how that Elizabeth was beyond her childbearing years, that it was in the realm of the miraculous. So that's why God makes the statement in the next verse, verse 37. Look at verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Wow. This was a statement made by Gabriel, who was a spokesman for God. So this was a statement from God to Mary, but Scripture writes it, for us, so it's to all of us that when you believe God, He will turn impossibilities into possibilities. Wow, I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I think I'm going to stop right there because uh, I want to pick up Mary's response to what she said and then what took place after that and her visit to Elizabeth and the things that took place that, that a lot of Christmas stories assume that uh, Joseph knew that Mary was pregnant, um, but she, he didn't for, for a long time. And I'm going to show you that in Scripture tomorrow as well. But um, we'll see Mary's response. But I just wanted to stop here. We're talking about the birth of Jesus and just stop and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Father God. God so loved the world that he gave. Here's the greatest gift ever given to mankind. He gave Jesus to us so that we would not perish, so that we would not be separate from God and then die eternally separated from God. That's why Jesus came. And so I just want to say thank you, Jesus, and pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone in my listening audience right now all over the world, Father, that you would just open the eyes of their understanding, fill them with the knowledge of your will, strengthen them with might by your spirit in their inner man, help them to know the hope of their calling, and help them to know the miraculous power that's available to them as a child of God, that it dwells in them, and his name is Jesus, and all things are possible because of that name. 
I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, if you want to, I know some people have asked, so if you want to make a donation, end of year donation for our ministry to help us just kick off the year, take off with Jesus, stay on the air, buy more airtime, be able to just do more for God, upgrade equipment when we have to. Uh, uh, preaching the gospel takes a lot of money. We know the gospel's free, but if you're getting the free gospel and you want to help pay to get it out to other people, then uh, we'd love you to give a donation. Pray about that. Consider that. I ask God, would I, have you, I don't care if it's $5, 5000 or $5 million. I don't care what the amount is. Whatever amount you give that, that you're able to give, uh, that's the part you're supposed to be faithful with. And as you're faithful with that, Bible says in Luke 16, God will make you a ruler of much. So if you can be faithful with the amounts you have, God will bless you with more. And if we put the kingdom of God first, then you'll be blessed. So call our toll-free number. If you want to donate, give a donation. You want to be, sign up as a monthly partner to help more people hear the word of God around the world because this program's blessed you. You want it to be a blessing to others, then become a monthly partner. The toll number is 888-887-WORD, 888-887-WORD, which is 9673. If you forget the numbers 9673, just remember, word 888-887-WORD. We're always preaching the word and the W-O-R-D then will tell you what numbers it is if you look at a keypad uh, on your phone. So 888-887-WORD is our toll-free number to give, to pray, ask for prayer, to order products, to do whatever you want to do. It's all available there. We're out of time. We're going to pick back up here tomorrow. I sure love you. I call you blessed. Merry, Merry Christmas again. Until tomorrow, have a Jesus-filled day. Bye-bye. If you would like to schedule Larry Hutton to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to LarryHutton.org and choose Contact Us from the menu bar or call 1-888-887-WORD. Many believers around the world have fed their faith to be healed by listening to God's Word on Heaven's Health Food. On this recording, Larry Hutton quotes all the Bible scriptures about health and healing from many versions of the Bible, so you can come to a full understanding that God wants you to be whole, well, and healthy. Just like the faith to be saved comes by hearing God's word about Jesus and salvation, faith to be healed comes by hearing God's word about healing. Spending time listening to these healing scriptures will help you establish forever that God intends for you to be well and that he has already provided for your healing in Jesus Christ. To order Heaven's Health Food, go to LarryHutton.org or call us at 888-887-WORD. Join us again for Limitless Life with Dr. Larry Hutton, where you'll get practical teaching from God's Word that you can apply to your everyday life. Go to LarryHutton.org to watch this program and many others you'll find special offers and resources to help you thrive in life. You can check on Larry and Liz's schedule and join them at a meeting near you. That's LarryHutton.org, or you can call 888-887-WORD.